class is when you have a group of people who they feel are a threat. So on the West Coast, there were more Japanese Americans than were on the East Coast. On the East Coast, they were spread you know, out and they, they were within the community and they didn't pose as a threat, so, so to speak. They didn't pose a threat on the West Coast either, but that was, that was the thinking at that time. Uh, what started, what um, began the roundup? What, what was the incident that, that Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor. And because of Pearl Harbor, because Japan, the government of Japan bombed uh, Hawaii, uh, and many, I know, thousands of Americans' lives were lost. Uh, that's what made the United States enter into World War II. And so there was a lot of hysteria in the country. Just like um, when 9-11 happened, what was the hysteria that happened? Yes, Middle Eastern. They, all people who were Islamic or Muslim were rounded up, right? And not rounded up, but were, uh, there were, a, there was a lot of prejudice and uh, words, thoughts that were not uh, true that were spoken about them. So um, one of the things that George W. Bush did as president, you know what he did, what he said during that time when people were hysterical about, uh, about Muslims? He stood up and he said, wait a minute, uh, Muslims, you, you, we can't do that to Muslims. They're peaceful people and not, they're not terrorists. That, it, the terrorism came from outside the United States. So he, stopped, he had the fortitude and the wisdom to say it's not right. So he stopped it. Now, today, it's not as much. <laughs> Well, our leadership isn't that strong against, quote unquote, the other. The other are kind of the targets now. Um, so one of the things I, I want you to think about through this uh, workshop is to think about what happened during the 40s, 40, uh, after 41, 45 that uh, discriminated and imprisoned the other. Um, there, there are a couple of things I, I want to talk about too, since I have a little bit of time. Is most history books refer to this as the Japanese American internment, and I won't refer to it as that because uh, what I want to talk about is the Japanese American concentration camps. Now, the reason we've, we've gone away from internment camp is that internment means the concentration of people who are alien to the United States. Well, two-thirds of the people who were rounded up, the 120,000 people who were rounded up, were American citizens. Um, my parents are Nisei. Nisei uh, means uh, second generation. So my mother was born in 1916. My father was born in 1914 in the United States. My mother was born in Washington State, and my father was born in Oregon. So my grandparents came in the early 1900s from Japan to um, better their lives. I mean, most people come to, uh, they, they hear about America as, uh, for, for Chinese, they heard about it as the Gold Mountain. It's often referred to as the Gold Mountain. So they came here to think, thinking that they could uh, earn a lot of money and send it back home to their families. In Japan at that time, in the early 19, late 1800s, early 1900s, in Japan, they, they were uh, experiencing a lot of uh, 
drought and poverty. And they had what you call primogeniture, which means that uh, everything is inherited through the first son. So if you were born uh, as the first son, you inherited all your family's land. Now, my grandparents were, my grandfather on my mother's side was the second son. So he knew he wasn't even getting anything. And besides, there was not much there for him to earn a living. So he had heard about how wonderful it was in America. You could get rich. So he decided to um, go to America and seek his future. Now he was, he was single and um, he said back home to his parents for a wife. Does anybody know what picture brides are? Can you guess what a picture bride would be? Yes, in Japan, and it's, it's kind of, I think it's, there's still a belief in this, um, that if your family is the one that decides who you should marry, um, it, so he sent back a letter to his family in Japan. He said, I'd like to get married. Please find a wife for me. So what he did, what, what happened was they sent him you know, several pictures, and he picked my grandmother. So she got on a ship, sailed over, and they got married. And to us, it seems kind of shocking you know, that you would do that. But um, it, it's funny because recently, or in the last few years, I have a friend from Japan, and we had gone to a party, and he said, well, I was introducing him to some friends, and he said, well, how did they meet? Or how did they get engaged? I said, oh, they met at a party. He said, at a party? I said, yeah. He said, well, how do they know their background? So in, in some senses, if your family sort of vets your possible um, mate, they feel it's a little more sure than sort of randomly finding someone, even on the internet, right? You take your chances. So in a sense, I mean, it's for centuries, that's the way people married. And they had basically successful lives. Well, it's now uh, 11. So what I thought I would do, uh, first I'll introduce myself. My name is Teresa Mybury, and I, um, I'm glad that I was able to, am able to come to your Diversity Day because I really believe that America is really moving towards diversity and we need to be inclusive. Um, we need to understand each other. So I'm glad to come here today. Um, I have taught for over 45 years, um, 36 of those years, I taught at Germantown Friends School in Philadelphia. And um, I'm now retired. Uh, and I, I am a member and, and a former officer of the Japanese American Citizens League, which is the oldest um, Asian American uh, civil rights organization in America. It started in the 1930s. Um, so I felt that it would be great if I came here today to kind of inform you about the hidden history of Japanese Americans in America and their experiences because a lot of things that happen to us as a minority are reflected in what's happening to other minorities today. Um, you think about the migrant uh, worker or migrant refugees and asylum seekers who are trying to get into America. What's happened to them? What's happening to them? Often they put in camps. You can see tent cities, right? <clears throat> and the children are separated from their parents. 
So I won't, as we go through this, I want you to think of the parallels that are happening at our borders today that happened to the Japanese American because they were known as the other. Um, I'm going to start off by doing an exercise called See, Think, Wonder. Have any of you done, have done this exercise? Okay. So what I'm going to do is you, ne the person next to you. So what's your name? Rosio. Rose? Rosio. Rosio. Can you sit next in this chair and then you can partner with this girl. Forget everybody's name. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you 30 seconds to talk to a, another person um, opposite you. And I want you to look at this map, OK? And for 30 second, seconds, I want you to brainstorm and think. I have paper, but I think I, I'll just let you brainstorm, and then I'll write up on the board. I want you to just tell me what you see, OK? So please start. say north, mm -hmm. uh, most of the what? Like the, the red. Most of the dots? No, like the red and white. The tan? Yeah. Popular cities. Can we bring the map back up? Yeah. Uh, I think if you just have, have the board, oh. it'll. Uh, no, probably not. <laughs> it's the board using a separate map. Um, but take a second. Okay. Okay, anybody else want to add to anything that you thought about? Okay, um, what do you think then? So th this is what you see. You saw dots mostly on the <coughs> west coast, not on the east coast. You thought that it shows, well actually, this is a think. Okay. 
You don't know that, do you? So that's a think. Uh, the, what did I say? The dots. Because it doesn't say that, does it? So that's your assumption, okay? So that's what we think. And, and the ten sections are mostly northern and is popular cities. Is that a think? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know if these are popular. Yeah. Is Topaz a city, Granada, Heart Mountain, Minidoka? I was going to say, I don't really recognize any of those. So I would say it's a popular. Mm -hmm. So, can we say they're popular cities? Mm. No. They're closer to popular cities, though. Okay. So, you, that's what you think, yeah. right? You think um, the dots are <coughs> close to cities, <coughs> meaning big cities. Any, okay, so we'll talk, I'll give you 30 seconds to talk about what you think now. We've got two things we think. Okay, so we can start. So, from um, the hand sections, we probably be spots could be like the population where there was more like Japanese. Okay, so you think that the tan areas have more JAs, Japanese Americans. Okay. Oh, I was thinking that the, the names with the dots are like the names of the camps. Is where people, the, dots. the dots are where people live. <coughs> um, you said like the names are like really unheard of, like we've never heard of them about it, what do you wonder? Wonder being, what questions do you have? What questions do you have about this map? I'll give you 30 seconds, go. Okay, stop. We'll start here in the middle. Uh, here. Uh, why is it mainly on 
the west side instead of the east. Why? Why about it and I show you a video, we'll be able to answer this. If not, I'll try to answer it. And we'll have, we'll have to see, did, our, was our thinking correct? Okay. So as I talk and as we hear the video, we see the video, let's keep those thoughts in mind. What I want to talk about is my connection to this map, my connection to the video. Um, as I titled this workshop, The Hidden History of the Japanese American Labor Camps, I was born in 1945. So I did not know how and under what circumstances I was born. Uh, when, I, when I would talk to uh, my students, they would say, where are you born? say Caldwell, Idaho, and I taught third and fourth graders. So one child, the next day came back, after, and I'm sure she was telling her parents, my new teacher, you know, uh, from, from she, she said she was born here. She said, so she came back the next day and she said, Ms. Maibori, what part of China were you born in? Okay, so what, I just chuckled. What were the, the errors she was making? What were the assumptions she made? That you're Chinese. That I was Chinese. What else? That you weren't born in America. That I wasn't born in America. That Caldwell, Idaho might as well have been China, right? Mm -hmm. She had no idea where Caldwell, Idaho was. So um, I, I often start when I'm talking to a group is, have you ever had this question asked of you? You speak such good English. Where are you from? Raise your hand if you've been, ever been asked that question. Okay, only one? Surprised. Okay. What's the assumption that's made when they ask that question? Why do they think that? Is, is there, is there uh, only one picture of what an American is? No. Because most people don't have that broad view of what America is composed of. So um, that's what that student was asking when she asked me that question. She, she assumed I wasn't American and that uh, I was from China. Um, so I decided after, when I retired, I was teaching refugees uh, at the, uh, an organization called the National Aid Service Center in Center City. And I, did, and I would get students from all over the world. And again, they would look at me, and I'm speaking English, and I'm trying to teach them the correct way to speak English. Uh, and so one young woman, uh, from the Ukraine, raised her hand and she said, where 
are you from? And so I, again, I chuckled and uh, I had spoken previously to some of the other students about it and I had them come and show where Caldwell, Idaho is. <coughs> Caldwell, Idaho is about right there. Um, so uh, as, I, as I was saying, my parents were both born in America in 1914 and 1916. So they were American. I know today, I think the president has said, what does what he call it? You can't, uh, he, he wants to banish people who have immigrated to America and then their children are born in America. He doesn't want them to become citizens. He doesn't think that that's right. But it's in our constitution that if you're born on this soil, you are an American citizen. All right. So my parents were both born in the United States. And uh, they, uh, my, my grandparents came in the early 1900s. So we've been in America for over 100, over 100 years. Um, when my student from when I was teaching uh, English as a second language, when she asked that, I decided, well, you know, maybe I should explore this a little bit and do a PowerPoint, go to Caldwell, Idaho, do a PowerPoint, and see what it looks like because I had never been back since I was born there. I was born in 1945, February. The war was over in August, 1945. So my parents left Caldwell, Idaho and went back to Seattle where they were originally from. Uh, so at that time, in 2014, when I was 69 years old, I, I said to my mother, Mom, do you want to take a road trip to Caldwell? And I was surprised because she said, yes, my mother was 98 years old. So we took a road trip of a thousand miles round trip to Caldwell. I called up ahead of time to the Chamber of Commerce and I said, you know, I want, I'm on a fact-finding trip. I want to know a little bit about the circumstances of my birth. Can you tell me a few things about where Japanese Americans were? And they said, oh, there's a site, um, it's now a site for low income housing, but uh, we can get you in touch with the uh, director. And it's uh, low income housing, and his name was Mike Dinberg. So we dr I drove there, and I introduced myself, and Mike showed me around the camp. Well, the camp is now for low income housing, but at the time that my parents resided there. It was a, a camp, a labor camp for my, it was created in 1939 by Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration. And it was created because of the migrants coming from Oklahoma and Arkansas. I don't know if you know any history, but do you know what was going on in the United States in 1939? that made um, people from Arkansas and Oklahoma mig to migrate to the West Coast. Yes? Um, Great Depression? The Great Depression. And the Dust Bowl. So they had nothing in those two states, so they packed up all their gear and they migrated to the West Coast to get work. So the, uh, it was kind of so the, the director said, well, it's kind of like early socialism. So Roosevelt had these camps built, these labor camps built for the migrant workers. Well, in 1942, what happened was uh, the war. And what do you think all those migrant workers did then? Were they going to labor in the fields anymore? What were they going to do? Fight hmm? Enlist in the military. Anything else? Were there lots of jobs? Yeah, like yeah. For the war, for the once the war, once war happens, war industry just burgeons, right? So uh, there was lots of jobs. They didn't have to be in the fields working. Uh, 
manual labor. So they left. So these um, camps were empty. Now, what had happened in 1942, by 1942, was that uh, Japanese Americans <coughs> were put in concentration camps, in 10 concentration camps. Those were the red dots. So some of you probably were right. Those were the majority of camps. My parents left Seattle and were assigned to Tule Lake. Tule Lake was uh, in Northern California. All these places were remote. They were, it was on a dry uh, lake bed. There was nothing in that vicinity except just, um, one of the reasons, one of you said, well, why was it, what was it near major cities? Most of these places were not near major cities. They were uh, in remote areas, but they had a rail line that went past it so that they could bring the people in, put them there. They had transportation to put them there and put, bring supplies, etc. cetera. So two, some of these were Indian reservations, okay? So why would they want to put them in remote areas? So people wouldn't know about them, exactly. There was um, information because there was hysteria after the after Pearl Harbor. So they said, "Yeah, get those Japs in away from here." So there was hysteria, and they wanted to get rid of anybody who had Japanese ancestry. So they put them. They were hurriedly built, uh, just like the camps along the southern border. They were hurriedly built. Um, and in, before they could go to these camps, they were, were in detention centers. So the detention centers were often racetracks. So my parents, once they were rounded up, they went to a, uh, a racetrack. They had to stuff their mattresses with straw. And many of them had to sleep in horse stalls that were not mucked out yet. So they were temporary because the concentration caps had not been built yet. So in Tule Lake, uh, at Tule Lake, it was the largest. There were 17,000 Japanese Americans in that concentration camp. They were uh, surrounded by barbed wire, and there were guards patrolling. So that, as they say, if they were trying to protect us, because that was one of the uh, reasons they said, well, we're going to take all the Japanese Americans and put them in camps because uh, the pop population is going to harm them. So let's all round them up and we'll protect them. Well, many, many of uh, my parents' generation said, well, that's not protecting us. The, the guns are pointed in. They're not pointed. Um, so anyway, they, they rounded them up and put them in these concentration camps. When I went to uh, Idaho, to Caldwell, um, all I knew about my birth was that my, my mother said, well, we got out of the Tule Lake by volunteering for, uh, uh, to harvest, to work in the fields. And a, a farmer sponsored us. So I took my birth certificate out and I was looking for any name of a, a farmer that sponsored and I couldn't find anything. So when I went to this uh, camp, uh, which is now, still exists, uh, the cottages that my parents lived in are gone. But there were two, two buildings that still existed. One was the main uh, shopping a center, there was a grocery or a market, the post office, and at the time that my parents were there, it was an employment office. So that building still stands, and the water tower. Uh, uh, Caldwell, Idaho is in a, in a very arid area of Idaho, so they didn't have much water, but the water tower supplied it. So those two um, buildings still existed. 
Um, Mike told us a lot and um, toured us around. And I asked my mother, do you remember any of this? And she kind of didn't, you know, she was 98. She, she, was, uh, she, she was very with it, but her memory was over, you know, it was over 70 years ago. So she said, well, Teresa, I was taking care of two infants. I didn't have time, you know, to remember, I can't remember all that. I remember bringing you up. My older brother was born in Tulipay, and so he was two years old, and then I came along. So her whole life was consumed by that while my father worked. And so that's what I, I learned, and I decided that I was going to write an article about my journey and what I was discovering. So I went on online, and I found this web website called Uprooted. And on Uprooted, um, they had much more information, much more research. And what I found out was that during that time with these camps, um, the Amalgamated Sugar Company didn't have laborers. All the sugar beets were in the fields, but they had no one to harvest it. So they said, oh, let's recruit those people in these concentration camps. They're just sitting around. Let's use them. So uh, the organization, the JACL, said, wait a minute. You can't just take people. Uh, so they negotiated and um, asked that, you know, there, there had to be transportation to the, to the area. They had to be given prevailing wages. And uh, they had to be able to have uh, decent housing. So these town areas are all the areas in which the people from the concentration camps volunteered to go to harvest. So there's several, as you can see, areas. Mostly, as you can see, most of it is in the northern, western part of the United States. <coughs> they harvested sugar beets. And what I learned from that website was sugar beets. What do you think of when you think of a, of a beet? Mm -hmm. It's a vegetable. It's about this size, right? It's red. Well, those are the kind of beets you eat. Sugar beets are used, they're big, they're from anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds, and they are used in the manufacture of sugar. I mean, yeah, they use to make use sugar, but the sugar is used to manufacture alcohol. And alcohol was used in uh, making synthetic rubber and in the manufacture of munitions. So bombs were made from those sugar beets. So all the farmers there didn't have anybody to harvest it, and they said, we need those we need it harvested because why couldn't we get sugar? Why couldn't we get rubber in the United States? Because the war was going on. The war was going on. There was an embargo against those goods. So uh, if you talk to your grandparents, or your, I think your grandparents, uh, they will say that you know there were hard times. You didn't have butter. You didn't have sugar, etc. So anyway, they, those tan areas, as some of you guessed, uh, are, are all the labor camps. This is where I was born, right there. OK. Now, um, let's see. When I quizzed my mother about what she remembered about living in Colombo, she said she didn't remember much. And then when I thought about it, I thought, well, you know, probably it was because of the trauma. Here she had been. She was an American citizen. She had just graduated from college. My mother and father were married on November 22, 1941. The bomb on Pearl Harbor was two weeks later. So their whole lives were up 
set. Um, they started their married life in concentration, in concentration camp. And I went, a few years ago, two years ago, I went with my sisters to Tule Lake, and we couldn't imagine how my mother gave birth to her first child in this camp. Um, when today, you know, we take so many precautions for a, a pregnant mother and the, the life of a newborn. Um, what I learned from the web, website was out of these concentration camps, 33,000 Japanese Americans volunteered. They volunteered to leave the camp. They went to these uh, areas and the recruitment, they, they got recruitment posters from the sugar company and it says, come and harvest sugar beets. It's a camp without barbed wire. It's a place you can make friends. It's a place you can earn a living. They gave seven reasons. Those are the highlights that I can remember. But I, I thought, um, okay, they, they, my parents said they did it because it was freer and they were freer and they wanted to help the war effort. They were Americans. They wanted to work for America. So they did it. And um, the, the other thing that my mother remembered was that when she went into town, into the city of Caldwell, there were signs posted on the groceries or grocery, any business, that said no jabs. So at that time, she knew she was unwelcome, that there were places that she could not uh, shop. Uh, the other thing was that even though it was a camp without barbed wire, they had a curfew. So you could not be <coughs> after uh, six and uh, at, not, uh, at night and you couldn't be out before six in the morning. However, if you were a laborer, you had to get out at four, so if you were out in the fields, it was okay. Uh, most of these labor camps, it was seasonal. So once the harvest was over, then you had to go back to the concentration camp. So to me, that you had a little bit of freedom and then suddenly you were back uh, within barbed wire. So um, I, there was a, a, an exhibit that I learned of and I brought it to Philadelphia and it was all about the labor camps. A photographer named Russell Lee did it for the Farm Securities Administration. Uh, he was a, a noted photographer. I don't know if you know the names of Dorothea Lang and um, Ansel Adams. But those two were also uh, employed by the Farm Securities Administration to photograph the concentration camps. Russell Lee's concentrated on the labor camps. So uh, he, that exhibit I brought to Philadelphia so that people could see what life was like during that time. Most of these photographs were not shown to the public. They were in the National Archives. And because of the Freedom of Information Act, they were allowed, to, to, we were allowed to go in there to see things. So that's why it was available. So what um, I want to do is to show you now a video. And I want you to think about what, the, what happened to the lives. Mostly it's about the people who went into the labor camps and how it changed their lives. And think about um, maybe what you would have done in this, these circumstances, what parallels we can think of today, and maybe some surprises that uh, came to you as you watch this. It was Sunday afternoon. We got the news. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. I happened to be in the Seattle hospital. All the doctors and nurses are 
huddled around the radio. There was an uh, announcement, no Japanese may travel. We didn't really know what was going to happen to us. We received a notice from the government At the time, saying all this was Japanese, she was regardless whether you are a citizen or not, prepare to leave your home. Also, you can only carry two suitcases with you. Our mother took us to J.C. Penney's and we picked out suitcases and they were cardboard suitcases. The only thing we could take was whatever you can carry. I still got my suitcase with a number on it and everything. I remember just packing party clothes <laughs> because they were our nicest clothes. Our mother sewed a big duffel bag and she stuffed everything in there that she thought we needed. They didn't give us much chance to do anything for a couple of weeks. So he sold one tractor, and from our house, we sold our piano, but we cheap, you know. <laughs> but we didn't get to sell anything else. We just left it in the house. Her mother, she, she cried. I remember her just crying about the fact that we had to move and lose everything. The government had these people come from Oklahoma and Arkansas, and they had them already ready to move into our farms and take over and harvest the crop and run the farm. It's kind of mind-boggling to think back of all that they had to do to get us together and move and get our farm settled and everything stored away. They didn't retaliate, they didn't fight, we just went, you know, quietly. And that's the way our parents, remember? Parents said, yeah. keep your mouth shut and just go quietly. Shut up and just do what you tell. Yeah. And that's the way it was. We just kind of fell in place and followed the instruction. Well, our parents really had to endure a lot of hardships, but, you know, we didn't feel the hardships as much as they did. The bus came to take us, and we were taken to a uh, stockyard. The assembly center, they called, which was the former stockyard. I know it was really humiliating for them when they did put this all in this, the horse stalls. <laughs> it's just as it was, the only thing she commented it was how bad it smelled. No ceiling, no door, just a curtain, and so, they all look alike. You don't know which is your room. No number, nothing. You can hear everything uh, next door. We were all fenced in with a guard, with a gun. That's where we were at the Sunday Center. Just prisoners. When we got in there, that was it. See, we couldn't get out. I remember guards at each corner, and they had a rifle, and this barbed wire. That fence was about four feet high, and this guy, he said, I'm not going to stay here, he said, I'm a citizen. He went up and they shot him. They never mentioned a name, they just kept them quiet. It was just like that. No name. But I remember, see, there was no sense of us escaping. Where would he go? This is ridiculous. When I think about it, I think, oh, that's almost unbelievable how we survived under those conditions. My dad didn't want to stay in there. He had five girls. He didn't want to stay in the camp where there's all kinds of people in there, thousands of people. The Sugar Beet Company from Nessa, Oregon, came to recruit workers. There was a call from Eastern Oregon asking for farm labor because all the men were in the service. Malcolm Sugar Company said, we need 3,000 extra workers. 
because of the increased production of sugar beets, something like 1,600 could be Japanese Americans. They would get behind on blocking the sugar beet, so they went to the Department of Agriculture, I guess, went to roll the belt and they okayed it. Even though the governors, April 7th, 42, said, we don't want the enemy in our states, the state officials who dealt with the sugar beet companies, the sugar beet farmers, said, we need workers. The field men came over there and they had a table like this, we signed up. First, uh, they had to be cleared by the FBI to make certain they were not on any lists. About 20 young men volunteers uh, will go and work. And I was the only woman. I said, I will go to work. Our group was the first family group. And there wasn't that many men that went. My father said that well, at least we get to do something and we're, we can work and we can make men. There was five boys and a sister and my father wanted to make sure that they went to public school. And that was the opportunity that presented itself there along with the freedom of being able to do as you please without, you know, being in a fenced-in place. My dad was probably already in his 80s when I asked him, uh, you know, were you kind of scared? He said his friends had told him, don't go because they're probably just going to shoot you. We were placed on a train at night. All the shades were pulled down. There was a guard on the train with a rifle. In a pistol. We gathered up our things again and rode the midnight train and in the morning we arrived in Mesa, Oregon. And there we were given canvas tents to live in with a hot wood stove to cook on in the hot weather of 110 degrees. take our shoes and stuff off the floor, put it on top of the bed, and there was a faucet up there, holes, so we used to drag it over there and put water on the wooden floor to cool our pin. When it rained, they finally gave us another cover to throw over the top so that the rain would come into that. Yeah, we used to sleep on wet bed, you know, when it rained. The farm labor camp south of Twin Falls, there were the uh, barracks, similar to the relocation center's barracks. Sleeping quarters, populated stove, beds, table and chairs in the rooms. And you had to go to a separate area where the hot water was located to get uh, showers and wash your clothes and sheets. The uh, wash tubs were located between the men's and women's <coughs> showers and facilities. And then Attached to that building was the uh, mess hall and meeting room because that's where I went to school. We were taken to hardware store. We were asked to buy a short handled hole, a file, work pants, work shoes, work shirt, and a straw hat. Just about bought up the hardware store <laughs> with all the equipment. Sometimes we traveled 20 miles on the back of a truck to get to the farmer's field. It was usually 4 o'clock in the morning, and that was cold in the early morning hours. The sugar beets were all thinned out by hand. They were all harvested by hand, topped by hand, and thrown up on trucks. Half day you're cutting it, topping it, the other half you're loading it take it to market, that's a lot of work. I was able to go out with my mother and father and uh, thin sugar beets. Actually, thought that was pretty good. I got paid 25 cents an hour the first year. I couldn't mock beets like some of the other guys and on my work and I made three dollars. And there was a set hourly wage when you were taking blocking. Some of it was piecework, so, so much per acre. We had to be bent all the way from one field to the end of the field, working with our short-handled hoe. So it was a very back-breaking job. It was hard work, you know, and the Lord knew it. Well, we were never used to it. We never did that kind of work until we came out here. 
some of those beats, they weren't light. They were anywhere from five to seven to 10 pounds per beat. Well, you come along with this uh, almost like a butcher knife that had a hook on the end of it. And you stab it, the sugar bead comes to a point, so you grab the small end of it and then you top it. The sugar bead, I think we took a butcher knife, we put them out and cut the stem off of it, throw them in the truck. Like that one. Even the ladies would, after the beads were stuck, we would roll it on the truck, you know. Some of the ladies, uh, they didn't they know their own strength. They went clear over the truck and the outside. That's why it was so labor intensive and why it was so important during the war for labor to come to this area to help the sugar bean harvest. You know, as kids, you don't think of it being real hard, but then later on you think, gee, I don't know how my mom and dad did all that work. The kids nowadays, they are astounded that we didn't stand for our rights. But I don't think in our generation, nobody really, you know, said this is wrong. Some people would say, well, you didn't talk about it because it was kind of a shameful period. Yeah, well, if it was a shameful period, you just kind of move on, you know. You can still have a future and you try to do the best you can and, and that's kind of the attitude that we lived with. are concentration camps, were we right? Yes. The dots are close to cities, is that correct? No. Uh, the tan areas have more Japanese Americans. Well, I guess they did. <laughs> uh, names of the dots are names of camps, is that true? The names of the dots? Okay. Yeah, Tule Lake, Minidoka, Manzanar, Kilo River, um, and uh, unheard of names. So we, we've never, have you ever heard of Roar in Arkansas or uh, Jerome? No, they, they were very remote. And I think you understood why they were remote, right? Um, and I think in the video, one of the women said, when we traveled, to those labor areas, the um, windows of the trains were blackened. Why do you think they were blackened? Maybe not knowing, not knowing where they were going. Anything else? So people didn't see them traveling. So people didn't see that there's a bunch of Japanese that they would think uh, going through the area. Um, okay. Why is Nevada empty? This is 40s, <laughs> early 40s. Do you think Las Vegas was there? Probably. I mean, it might have been there, but it wasn't the, same. the capital of gambling at that point. I think it probably arose after the World War II. Um, and it's a good question why uh, sometimes the governors, the gov maybe they didn't have any crops uh, that needed harvesting, at least it, there's no uh, tan area. But um, the other thing was, as I mentioned before, when, when I went to Tule Lake, they said, well, they chose it because it was a rail line that went through. And maybe there weren't any rail lines that were anywhere near them. So I don't really know the answer to that. Why is it showing the west and not the east? There were no camps on the east coast because they weren't considered a threat. They were, um, as the saying, um, they, they they weren't a critical mass. Japanese Americans were not a critical mass at that point. Um, 
why are the 10 areas not always near a dot? Because that they were where farms were located. Okay. And why do some states have more than one dot? California has more. Uh, Arkansas, Arizona. That's a good observation. Why do some have more than one dot? Um, they probably have like a higher population of Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. So in, in Arizona, I mean. Arkansas. Oh, yeah. So there were more like rail lines like, going through different like, areas? That and the government had to find a place where they could quickly construct um, a, a camp. It's like really and, remote areas? Yes, in remote areas. And like I said, where were some of those camps? Yeah. On Indian reservations. So. Uh, I don't think in Arkansas was a, a, it would be interesting at, to research why they were there. But those were good questions. Now, kind of open it up to you. Do you have questions about what you learned today or saw or about the video? Yes. Uh, so did a lot of Japanese move to the east? Um, they're actually, it's really interesting if you want to know a little bit more about uh, Japanese Americans who came to the East Coast, you could go to Seabrook, New Jersey. And in Seabrook, New Jersey, they recruited out of the camps after the war because John Seabrook owned a farm there and he needed workers. So he recruited out of the camps and there was thousands of Japanese Americans who went there to help harvest crops. And he had, he, uh, the Seabrook Farms, it, it was known as the first, uh, you've heard of bird's eye frozen foods? They, he, they invented flash freezing. So they could freeze uh, their crops. So in Seabrook, there were many Japanese Americans who came to the uh, East Coast. And I would ask a person from Seabrook, I said, well, why didn't you go back to the West Coast? Then he looked at me and he said, there was nothing to go back to. We had no home. We had no possessions. People hated us there. We needed to start anew. So some people wanted to go back and start again. Some people said, forget it. I've had it. I'm going to start on the East Coast. Any other questions? Yes. So the Japanese property that was where that those folks left, what happened to that property? It was sold. What did they say? A dime on a dollar or something. I mean, they they were sold for practically nothing if if the family owned it. There were laws uh, in California, anti uh, alien land laws, and so the children who were American citizens, a lot of the families put the f family farm in the name of the children. Um, but uh, they had to sell off, so they, they didn't uh, have anything to go back to. Now, my parents were lucky. Um, they had just gotten married, and they lived in a small town south of Seattle. And when they left, they were renting a house, and the landlord said, We'll save your things, because they had just gotten married. They had all their wedding gifts. And he said, we'll save your things, and you can come back. And so from 42 to 45, the landlord kept their things, and they came back. And to his word, uh, they continued to rent there. That's where I grew up. Uh, but it wasn't always that way. Many people, in fact, were in that small town of Auburn, left, and uh, they worked uh, in Oregon in here. And the, the uh, farmers who saw how hard working the Japanese Americans were were saying, hey, you don't need to go back to where you came from. Stay here. We'll welcome you. So there's a whole contingent of many, many families, I would say at least 100, 
who left Auburn and went to Eastern Oregon and started their lives again. And the reason I know that is because every summer, those families would come back for a reunion in my hometown with people that remained there or who came back after the war. So, but they, they had a prosperous life at yeah, farming. Sometimes I ask uh, students, what would you take if you could take only two suitcases? What would it be that you would take? And remember, there was no electronics in those days. The other thing is they couldn't take a camera and they couldn't take a radio. Does anybody have any idea what they would take? Suitcase of clothes and suitcase of books. Okay. Yeah. Remember what she said. <laughs> remember what she said. What kind of clothes did they pack? Their party clothes. Because that was their best clothes. Because they didn't. I asked my mother. Well, what? What did you put in your suitcase? She said. Well, we didn't know where we were going. We had no idea. We had no idea of the climate or anything. So again. She says, we just packed like an overnight case, and that was it. Fortunately, my mother was, had gone to college and uh, majored in design, clothing design, so she could sew up a store. So they, the thing the government didn't realize was they could do mail order. So they got the Sears and Roebuck catalog and the Montgomery Ward catalog, and they ordered things through the mail. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was interesting. Anybody else have something they would take? Someone thought about their pets. Could you take your pet? You think you could take your pet? No. You had to get rid of your pet. Okay. Uh, you were a great audience. I hope you had an interesting time here and I have some books up here. This is on Caldwell, where I was born. It shows the camp that now exists and when it did uh, before. Here is, uh, I went to Truly Lake in 2014, or 2017, and some other things, uh, and an, an article that was written in the Inquirer in 2016 about the exhibit. The other thing that I was really grateful for was I remember I told you my mother, I took my mother when she was 98 years old in 2014. Uh, two months later she died. So I was so happy that we had that time together. Uh, and that I could at least, I think she was very happy to go because I took an interest in what their lives were like. So if you want to look at some of these things, uh, feel free to. And if you want to do more research, you can um, talk to me or uh, find out some more source material. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.